And uh, I'm really glad now to introduce uh, the next panel that in a sense connects really well with uh, the keynote that we just had because now we enter uh, into the depth of ICS media strategies and also countermeasures. Um, and we decided to call this panel Cyber Jihad that uh, was actually one of the critical words that we were discussing whether to use or not. And I had a great conversation on that with the moderator, uh, Frederica Kaltoyer, that is going to introduce uh, the panel. Uh, and I actually really enjoy our first discussion on this topic because we were wondering uh, um, if this word uh, should be used, what is the meaning of that? So we were basically already discussing when we were preparing this panel. And uh, let's see if we will learn more through our participants. Um, also, I want to tell you, uh, reminds that, uh, remind you that uh, on Sunday there will be a workshop at Supermarkt that is called Facing Terrorist Threats, Cybersecurity and Digital Self-Defense, always with uh, Ayman Altamimi and Dilshad um, Otman. So what you will hear today is also going to be more in depth described on Sunday from 2 to 5. So if you want to register, you can still do. We have still some places available you can do at the entrance. And now I want to introduce uh, Frederike Kaltoiner because, uh, um, I mean, then she will introduce <laughs> the rest of the panel. Um, Frederike is a program lead and policy officer at Privacy International. Um, and uh, in the past, she has been developing uh, Privacy International position on the privacy and security challenges on connected spaces. In 2016, she was a transatlantic digital fellow on cybersecurity and platform regulation with the Global Public Policy Institute in Berlin and the New American Foundation in DC. And uh, she holds a uh, MCC in Internet uh, Science from the University of Oxford. This is also a connection here because Ayman is also working at Oxford. And uh, her thesis was Web Archiving the Egyptian Revolution. Uh, at the same time, she was previously a researcher at the University of Amsterdam and visiting scholar at Bogazici University in Istanbul. Um, so now I leave the word to you and I welcome our speaker and thanks a lot for being here. Thank you very much for this elaborate introduction. Uh, welcome, I hope you had a nice break and I'm very happy to be here with uh, Ayman Altamimi. Um, he asked me to give a very brief introduction, which is what I'm going to do. He's a fellow at the Middle Eastern Forum and he loves to collect uh, Islamic State documents. Um, also with me is Dilshad Otman. He's a digital security advisor for Internews Network. Uh, he's also one of the authors of the Internet Freedom Report on Syria. I'm going to give a little brief introduction and then uh, followed by two presentations and you're more than welcome to ask questions afterwards. And the reason I'm giving an introduction is that I'm not an expert on Middle Eastern studies at all. Um, but in my work, I'm looking at data exploitation in the private sector, so online platforms, um, privacy invasion, surveillance. So if you follow the news these days, it seems like the Internet has been weaponized. Even though the focus of this event is extremist content, uh, propaganda and recruitment, I think one cannot fail to observe a broader trend. So from discussions about fake news, hate speech, foreign-sponsored sponsored, micro-targeted advertisement, computational propaganda, it seems as if violent extremism on the one hand and right-wing populism on the other hand uh, has hijacked and played uh, infrastructure that is very critical for democr democracy. So social media, it, those are the spaces in which we find and share information, in which we learn about others, in which we mobilize and in which we communicate. But in this context, it's also very important to remember that just a few years ago, the narrative was quite the opposite. Foreign policy experts discovered, somewhat naively, uh, Twitter and Facebook revolutions. Um, and, and to one extent, I think many internet freedom discourses uh, are based upon the premise that a free and open internet in which individuals can freely express themselves is inherently good for democracy. 
so I think technological determinism to say that technology is either good or bad is always flawed. Um, and to believe in the inherent goodness of technology uh, is always misguided. But at the same time, I think it's too easy to say that in the past we were naive and now we've seen the dark side. I think a more painful and more complex analysis would be to admit that we're only beginning to understand uh, the politics of the platforms um, that we're surrounding ourselves with, even though they're far from new, they've been around for a decade now. Um, and it's very difficult to understand these platforms because on the one hand, they're proprietary systems uh, and therefore opaque, they're owned by companies, and these corporate owners have the discretion to determine what can and cannot be said, and even more importantly, what gets attention and what doesn't get attention. Uh, it's also difficult because these systems are highly complex, constantly evolving. For example, the Facebook newsfeed gets up updated daily. They increasingly rely on intelligence and automation, uh, and to some extent there's also a moment of unpredictability where the designers of the systems don't even know what gets attention and what doesn't. There's lots of excellent research out there on this, but I think it, we have to admit that we're only beginning to understand these systems in their full complexity. This is important, and I'm going to stop soon, and because I would love to l learn more from you as well. I think understanding and, and, and admitting that we have yet to understand these systems fully is important because some of the ideas or proposals that are su suggested to combat propaganda and misinformation are also deeply troubling from a human rights perspective. Uh, I live in the UK. After every single terrorist attack, Amber Rudd, uh, is trying to undermine encryption, which sort of working for privacy organization we find very troubling. The question is, do we really want corporations to make the difficult decisions about what qualifies as hate? How much surveillance, limitations to freedom of expression and in invasions of privacy are we willing to accept in the name of fighting extremism? I'm gonna stop right here and we'll discuss more on the questions and I'm very much looking forward to your presentation now. So what is interesting is how you, how you discovered this topic and how you started working on it. Maybe not everybody has read your longer biography. Uh, I don't really have a long biography. Uh, it's just that I was following uh, uh, Islamic State. It was emerging in Syria in uh, 2013 or so, and I was uh, still a student at the time, a, an undergraduate student. And uh, because of the way that uh, the media content was disseminated at the time, uh, I mean, Twitter was the main platform, but it was also a very, very irregular means of distribution. When the Islamic State started emerging in uh, Syria, um, some of the first uh, sources of uh, evidence for the presence in terms of media dissemination uh, was something called uh, a sham foundation, like some random outlet that was set up in Raqqa. Um, in uh, around April or May of 2013. Um, and sometimes, you know, you'd have to find uh, content by looking at uh, Facebook pages. And then over time, it became uh, more and more regularized. And thankfully, over time, also, there's been some documentary evidence we've been able to collect uh, that shed more light on the functioning of uh, the Islamic State. So now that my presentation is finally up, um, uh, and I thank the previous speakers, uh, uh, in particular Charlie, for the background on uh, the broad trends uh, underlying Islamic State propaganda production. Um, I'm going to talk more in depth about uh, the media structure and the various media strategies that you know lie behind that structure and uh, the content produced. Um, so in terms of document uh, collection, uh, one document was found uh, by a businessman that I've come to know of from in Membij when it was controlled in East Aleppo, when it was controlled by the Islamic State. He had this uh, uh, little book which was called Principles in the Administration of the Islamic State. And uh, it's not like uh, you know some outline, very, very, very detailed uh, genius plan behind the functioning of the Islamic State. But it does give a sense of uh, the, uh, it does give like general suggestions about how this state project should function. And one of the sections specifically, uh, which is this page outlined here, deals with media, pro uh, the media structure. Um, 
So it suggests, for, uh, for example, to set up a central um, mother, mother foundation or central foundation. Uh, just by the way, in terms of when this was written, it was, uh, I think, around mid-2014 after the caliphate was declared. So pretty soon after it was declared. Um, it suggests for having this central foundation, it should be directly tied to the, uh, to the caliph's office, uh, Abu Bakr al-Baghdadi's office, and, or the uh, Shura Council, and it should provide the broad directives by which the media should function. Uh, so, for example, it uh, suggests that this central foundation should have control over the uh, media campaigns. Uh, of the Islamic State. Now, uh, media campaigns, what we mean by that, for example, is um, a lot of the uh, lower offices would produce, say, uh, in, in previous times, would produce multiple videos within a set of, say, a few days that all focused around one topic. Uh, so an example of that would be a media campaign that several of the provincial offices, which is the second kind of uh, media office or institution distinguished in this uh, document. Uh, several of the uh, media, uh, uh, provincial, provincial offices produced uh, videos in a matter of a few days uh, trying to urge uh, jihadis in Somalia to give allegiance to uh, the Islamic State. Um, it wasn't the first of its kind in terms of an appeal for allegiance. They'd also done it in the Maghreb, for example, appealing to the Maghreb region, for example. Um, and, uh, but the uh, tone of the Somalia one was very, very friendly, despite the existence of an Al-Qaeda affiliate in Somalia that opposed the Islamic State. Uh, but I suspect the reason for the friendly tone was because there had been no public uh, denunciation of the Islamic State by a shabab uh, uh, to that point. I'm not going to go too much into depth for that, but that kind, so media campaigns is something very much that corresponds to the suggestions outlined here. Provincial offices, these uh, correspond to each province of the Islamic State. And then finally, they, the text talks about setting, setting up so-called auxiliary foundations or outlets. Um, so if we look about how this corresponds in the real uh, Islamic State structure, you know, you do have like the original foundation. Uh, you could go, goes by the name of the Diwan al-Alam or the, uh, the media department. And the Diwans, of course, are connected to the uh, Majlis Shura. Uh, and in turn associated with those are these so-called central media foundations. Uh, and then you have provincial media offices. And then there is one outlet that qualifies as auxiliary in, in the broad sense talked about in the principles in the administration of the Islamic State. Um, so, for example, I mean, in terms of central media outlets, uh, you have uh, Al Furqan Media, which has existed since uh, the inception of the Islamic State as a state project, when it was called the Islamic State of Iraq, was mentioned by one of the previous speakers. So, this going back all the way back to 2006, 2007. Um, but then, over as the, once the Islamic State expanded I into Syria. Uh, you began to see the creation of more central media outlets. So a good example of this uh, is Ajnad Media, which uh, produces uh, songs or nasheeds uh, in Arabic and uh, recitations of parts of the Quran. Um, uh, Ajnad Media will come on to actually a bit later as well because it's relevant to shifts in uh, messaging strategies over time. Um, then, of course, as the Islamic State kept on expanding in 2014, you had the creation of Al-Hayat Media, which is specifically designed to outreach to foreigners in a variety of languages. Uh, so it's responsible for the current magazine called Rumia, which is supposed to be released on a regular basis in multiple languages, English, French, German, Pashto, etc. But it also produced, uh, in the past, specific magazines uh, in uh, particular languages. So Darbic in English and Dar al-Islam in French. But these magazines are no longer in production. Uh, I mean, with Darbic, it seems very, uh, fairly clear why it stopped production. Because once the Islamic State lost control of Darbic in Aleppo to uh, the Turkish-backed Syrian rebels, I think it kind of lost its significance in the playing up the idea of apocalyptic messaging and the final clash with the West. Instead, you had to say, well, actually, the real battle has not yet come. Um, 
During 2013, there was also an, another outlet set up called Al-Ittisam, but it actually seems to have stopped uh, functioning once the caliphate was declared. I mean, the idea of it was to produce videos, uh, series, for example, Windows on the Land of Epic Battles, and it was, uh, they produced a variety of different kinds of messaging uh, aimed at uh, different constituents. I mean, for example, there was one video from November 2013 by this outlet, uh, that had Iraqi Kurdish fighters speaking in Kurdish and addressing threats to the Kurdistan regional government, uh, clearly designed to, you know, appeal to uh, jihadi recruitment, uh, appealing to recruit Kurds. Um, beyond this, you have, you know, the radio station. This was mentioned by Charlie and the and Naba newsletter, which is exclusively in Arabic and distributed on a weekly basis. Um, then you have the provincial media offices. So again, this corresponds to uh, the to the uh, to the outlines and principles in the administration of Islamic State. But these these first actually began attaining prominence in 2013. Um, so I mentioned uh, when the Islamic State first emerged in Syria, uh, trying to track its content was very very haphazard indeed. Um, you would have to go on Twitter and find some of these outlets that might put out content of the Islamic State, of, of say, ISIS murals in a particular region of Syria, or you might even have to go to a Facebook page to try to find it. Uh, what the provincial media accounts uh, are doing, of course, is they try to streamline more of that content and make it less haphazard and put it all into one official stream in a particular region. Um, uh, and so in theory, you should have, uh, as of now, and it expanded over the course uh, since 2013, you should in theory have around 35 provincial media offices in, in concordance with the number of provinces of the Islamic State that officially exist, 19 in Iraq and Syria and 16 outside. But what you also have more recently are quasi-provincial media offices. And what I mean by this is, uh, uh, is media output uh, of very similar kind and content like photo releases and videos uh, from uh, areas where the Islamic State militarily operates but hasn't declared a province. Uh, so an example of this would be Somalia uh, and uh, Bangladesh and East Asia, or the Philippines as more commonly known. Um, the, there's often been misconception among analysts who follow this that they thought the Islamic State was declaring new provinces in these areas like Somalia and Bengal and, and Bangladesh, but actually the, uh, they haven't done such a thing. They haven't declared a province since uh, June of 2015 when they announced a province in the Caucasus. So even though these are not pr officially provinces, they're actually, uh, some of these places are way more productive than official provinces of the Islamic State now. Uh, like you have stuff from Somalia and uh, whereas you know like the Caucasus province is very almost completely dormant um, and then finally you've got something in southwest Syria that's called uh, Jaish Khalid bin al-Walid and this is an interesting uh, thing that we will talk about in a, in a bit more detail um, but I think actually in terms of the broad outline here the most interesting thing in terms of media strategies is this and that provokes the most interest is the auxiliary outlet of the uh, Islamic State, which is called the AMAC, uh, or, the, which, or the auxiliary outlet of the Islamic State, which translates to AMAC News Agency. And it first emerged in around autumn 2014 when uh, the Islamic State was engaged in this campaign to try to take uh, Kobani in, on the border with Turkey uh, from the uh, PKK. Um, among the founders of it was a guy called Rayan Mesh'al, who was involved in uh, the Aleppo News Network, which was this uh, pro-opposition news network in uh, Aleppo that actually provided some of the very early coverage of the Islamic State's uh, military activities in, in that region of Syria. Not like it's necessarily endorsing it, but they had access to them, clearly. Um, but AMAC actually is not formally acknowledged by the Islamic State. This is why I'd say it's an auxiliary outlet, because AMAC is actually not formally acknowledged by the Islamic State as being part of its apparatus. Uh, if you look at a video called Structure of the Caliphate, which was put out in July 2016, uh, in terms of detailing the media outlets of the Islamic State, AMAC News does not, in fact, turn up in that, uh, uh, in that video. Nonetheless, it's very clear, uh, if you compare with the talk of an auxiliary outlet as suggested in uh, Principles in the Administration of the Islamic State, that this is exactly, this is, this, the, the, it is part of the Islamic State, it's just not it's just in everything but a formal acknowledgement. Um, 
So the functioning of AMAC, uh, it, it, well, as its name suggests, it probably does function like a news agency and quote in, uh, takes the style of uh, articles of uh, sources quoted by AMAC uh, talking about, for example, military operations or provision of services in various areas, and it tries to use a more neutral sounding language, uh, even though most people now can recognize it's part of the Islamic State. So rather than using the word Rafadi, or, uh, which is a derogatory word for Shia, the Amak news will just stick to Shia. Likewise, if it talks about the Syrian uh, regime, it will just say the Syrian regime rather than uh, Nusayri, which is a derogatory word for Alawites you know, being associated with the Syrian regime. Um, the interesting thing that uh, further suggests it's a, as an auxiliary outlet is that according to principles in the administration of the Islamic State, uh, the auxiliary outlet should not cover uh, implementation of uh, judgments, so like punishments of theft and adultery, for example. Um, I, I'm not quite as thorough as Charlie Winter in tracking all of this stuff, so he's free to correct me if I've actually got this wrong. But I haven't seen an AMAC uh, video uh, or news item that actually shows someone's hand being cut off for theft or someone being stoned for adultery, for example. Um, but where it does diverge, and this is where, of course, when you're a collector of documents, you have to be important not to go be too dogmatic about everything and not try to just rigidly stick to everything. You have to remember that the principles of the administration of the Islamic State is a, uh, it's like a position paper, as it were. Uh, the principles of the administration of the Islamic State actually suggested that uh, an auxiliary outlet should not cover so-called security operations. Uh, that is, operations in the heart of uh, enemy territory. Uh, so, for example, a suicide bombing in Baghdad city or an attack in Paris, that is a so-called security operation, uh, to use the Arabic terminology. But in fact, AMAC very extensively covers this stuff, and it's often used as the, into, as a, uh, and this gets on to directly to media strategy, it's often used as the first means of claiming an operation uh, in the West. A uh, very good example of this is the Las Vegas attack, where the claim was first put out by AMAC News, and they quoted a source a so-called source is saying that the attacker was converted to Islam months ago and he was a soldier of the caliphate, etc. And then they followed it up with an official claim uh, in the name of the Islamic State. But what is interesting about Amag News is it could sometimes be used for what I would call a tentative claim that might not be followed up. So in the case of the uh, Las Vegas attack, uh, they very clearly doubled down on claiming it as their own, and you can explore a variety of reasons why they do it. That uh, Charlie Winter mentioned, for example, the propaganda uh, by deed and claiming the attack and the psychological effect it can have on people. I think actually in the context of Las Vegas, for example, one very obvious reason to double down on the claim uh, would be to try to play on you know, conspiratorial politics in America and conspiratorial media discourse so that even if, like, say, the FBI finds that there's no link between the attacker and the Islamic State, they'll say, well, actually, this is a cover-up to cover up Islamic terrorism in, in the U.S. Um, but at the same time, uh, going back to IMAC News, it could sometimes be used for a tentative claim. Uh, a good example is this was an attack in the Philippines. Uh, uh, someone broke into a casino and killed dozens of people. And the AMAC News quoted a source as saying that the attacker was one of the uh, soldiers of the caliphate. But uh, there was no uh, subsequent evidence to show that that was actually true. And to my knowledge, and again, Charlie Winter could perhaps correct me if I'm actually wrong about this, uh, please do, uh, is that uh, the, uh, the, the, the uh, claim was not actually followed up beyond AMAC. So, Although everyone, pretty much everyone recognizes AMAC is part of the uh, uh, media apparatus of the Islamic State, uh, in just limiting the claim to AMAC, you could, the Islamic State can play a game of saying, well, actually, we didn't claim the attack. We just had a source say to AMAC that the attacker was part of the Islamic State. But, you know, we never followed it up. We didn't officially claim it. Um, so it's an interesting, like, uh, manipulation that's, uh, the g manipulations that go on with uh, the use of AMAC news. And I think it's the most, for me, for me, it's certainly the most interesting part of the Islamic State's media apparatus and, and its strategies. Um, going more on to just the content uh, and uh, the strategies that underline the themes of Islamic State propaganda, Charlie Winter has already mentioned. Uh, some of these in his presentation, uh, like governance, uh, the portrayal of ordinary life. Interesting theme is also nature. Uh, 
Uh, but then you have military things like battles, uh, depiction of brutal executions, the depiction of the suffering of Muslim civilians living in Islamic State territory, uh, and then individual items that, say, might highlight martyrs and so-called martyrdom operatives or suicide bombers. Um, we have found some documentary evidence that uh, shows, uh, you know, how, so how, say, the production of an item might work. Uh, this is from uh, uh, Raqqa province, and it details the activities of the Diwan al-Khidmat, or the services department, uh, implanting trees in various areas. And it asks the media, the media office in, uh, the provincial media office in Raqqa is requested to cover uh, those, uh, uh, to, cover that, to cover that work. Um, likewise, a uh, similar example, actually touching on a different theme, would be uh, a, an internal report of Dawa activity that I found from the Ramadi Belt area in Ambar uh, in around the summer of 2015. And it mentions the, office, uh, the media activities to be done in, uh, by, the, by the Dawa office of the Ramadi Belt area. So for example, they mentioned visiting damaged mosques and you know, taking photographs of them. So, of course, the implication is when you have damaged mosques and you put photos of them, you say, well, look how barbaric our enemies are and that they wage war on Islam by destroying uh, symbols of, uh, you know, Islamic, uh, of Islam and Islamic identity. Um, by the way, how much time do I have? Uh, just a little bit. Okay. Um, I just show here some recent examples of various things that the uh, Islamic State has put out. Uh, and so the Jaysh Khalid bin al-Walid I mentioned uh, in, based in southwest Syria, it's an enclave along the Golan Heights. Like Amak News, actually, it, uh, it has not been formally acknowledged as part of the Islamic State, but it is for all intents and purposes. They follow the same media style, they do uh, the same kind of themes of production, and if you talk to people who are uh, part of the group and their supporters, uh, as I have to do as part of my research, then they, uh, they regularly mention, you know, being part of the, say they're part of the Islamic State. Um, Charlie Winter mentioned about the decline of uh, the general focus towards uh, military operations. Well, the Jaysh Khalid bin Walid is an exception to that trend in that it actually is portraying uh, implementation of governance. So whereas the Islamic State has been contracting everywhere else in Iraq and Syria, this enclave uh, remains in place in, 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 the, in the corner along, alongside the occupied Golan Heights. And um, uh, it has uh, developing uh, governance uh, offices like the HISPA office here. Uh, and uh, I've, I have some internal documents that show, you know, the uh, growing number of regulations, for example. Uh, for example, uh, ban uh, banning uh, Nike uh, logos on T-shirts. So this has come much, much later than uh, the Islamic State's original ban on this in places like Raqqa. But it's the same kind of pattern as the, you know, they consolidate uh, and uh, develop their administration in their areas of control. But most other areas uh, of the Islamic State are not like that. Uh, so they're from Euphrates province. This is a depiction of military operations. And this is the overwhelmingly the norm now uh, in the Islamic State's uh, overall media production. Sometimes you get some cool nature photos like this one from, uh, I, it is pretty cool, I have to say. Um, <laughs> it's from uh, uh, Afghanistan and uh, 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 depicting snowfall. Uh, they did similar thing in Somalia, for example. And uh, I think the goal of that is to try to say that, uh, look how beautiful the areas are where we operate. And of course, it's aesthetic appeal to their supporters in particular. I think, though, in the future, it could be remove the logos and you could make a good advertising for tourism to these areas. Um, <laughs> um, I just also talk about some general shifts over time. Um, Charlie already mentioned this about the move to closed forums on Telegram. And I think as Charlie argued correctly, I don't think that's because they wanted, you no, know, this is like a master plan, they wanted it. You know, in the ideal world, they would be on Twitter. Uh, uh, freely operating, and you know there were a number of media strategies we observed in the time when they were on. They were so prominent on Twitter, like for example, hijacking uh, hashtags, you know, say associated with the World Cup, for example, uh, to actually frighten people into saying you know the Islamic State is you know, coming to Baghdad, for example. Um, but uh, now that you know that that no longer exists, so you have to move to these closed forums on Telegram. Um, and also you have the rhetorical emphasis on the state remaining rather than expanding, even if it doesn't control territory. So 
most people are probably familiar with the slogan of Bakia or Tetamedded or remaining and expanding, but now it's really just a focus on remaining. And you see this, for example, in the recent song releases by Edge and Ad Media, which have the following titles. Um, all of this is about this not being vanquished by the enemy. Um, these are examples of uh, Telegram channels that uh, regularly disseminate Islamic State content. And uh, as Charlie mentioned also, and I, I've observed it myself, this one, for example, you know, this stays up for months and months at a time and it doesn't get deleted. Um, although there was like a spike to try to crack down on these channels when the Paris attacks happened, uh, the fact is a lot of these uh, channels, for example, they only have a couple hundred members. Uh, and it's only, you can only access them by invites that are temporarily put out. And uh, uh, they just keep on going for months and months. So partly there's a recognition of uh, difficulties in operating on the internet and the need to uh, nonetheless appeal to at least your supporters. And so turning inward to these, uh, to these closed channels. The final thing I'm just gonna say, this is, I promise, the end of this, <laughs> is the wider influence impa uh, of uh, the Islamic State's media development over time. Uh, it's pretty clear, actually, when you look at, say, other jihadist groups in Syria, for, uh, in particular, Jabhat al-Nusra and uh, its successors, that, you know, the Islamic State kind of set trends for them that they wanted to emulate. So, like, well, high-quality photos and videos, uh, pretty much a lot of people are doing, these, are, are doing that nowadays. Uh, and, uh, you know, militant groups in, in Syria of, uh, of all kinds. Um, but provincial news feeds, that was definitely something the Islamic State kind of came up with. And then, you know, Jebedin Nusra imitated it, for example, by having these so-called you know, Dera correspondent or Aleppo correspondent and Hama correspondent. So the same kind of provincial news feeds to streamline things. Uh, and then auxiliary agencies, actually, I think that AMAC also set a kind of precedent. Um, if you look at uh, the successor to Jebhat al-Nusra, which is called uh, Hayat Tahrir al-Sham, they set up something called the uh, Ibar News Agency, which follows a very, very similar style to AMAC. Uh, but it's, you know, uh, uh, most observers can recognize it's part of the uh, Hayat Tahrir al-Sham's media apparatus. But it follows the same style of quoting a source to Ibar, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Uh, so thank you very, very much for this opportunity to speak. I hope this wasn't uh, too detailed, too drowning out in too much detail. And this is my website and my email in case you want to contact me. So thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Um, I'm looking forward to the next presentation. Do you also want to introduce yourself a bit more elaborately? Yeah, sure. sure. No. Right, so hello everyone. Um, thanks uh, for having me here. Um, uh, I'll just give you a little background. So, um, um, currently, I work as a digital security uh, advisor for Intra News Network in Washington. Okay, closer? Okay. In Washington, D.C. And uh, being Syrian, I've been working on uh, the digital security uh, uh, side of the conflict uh, in Syria, starting from the uprising in 2011. And then we've uh, uh, We've been um, witnessing many groups showing on the on the cyber uh, conflict uh, space, uh, like the cyber jihadists. Um, at the beginning, cyber jihad is not a new thing. It's not something that ISIS created. Uh, but uh, way before, um, during um, the the 2006 war, during the Gaza uh, uh, the Gaza conflict, for example, every time there was something, there will be a wave of. Uh, cyber jihadists or decentralized hackers that they organize themselves on social network to do some, um, um, I would say, elementary level uh, cyber attacks like hitting websites, bring, uh, de de doing some denial of service attack. Just, uh, I, I will be using a lot of technical terms. I'll try my best to explain, but in case if I missed something, please raise your hand. <laughs> so these kind of attacks, they were decentralized um, and organized, mostly um, carried by teenagers that they just create a Twitter profile and they will add um, a Qaeda flag and start tweeting or, or uh, asking for support to take down specific websites. Um, but the actual cyber jihad or the idea of organized 
um, hacking group actually started, I'm not sure, ah, okay. Okay, actually it was inspired by the Syrian Electronic Army. Um, the Syrian Electronic Army is, um, it's, it's the same thing. It started with a group of hacktivists, um, social network users, uh, trying to um, um, hack websites like this or comments on uh, Western news outlets um, uh, using comments that it's pro-regime, saying that this is, um, uh, this is a war on terror, uh, those are terrorists, do not believe them, and stuff like that. But then the Syrian, when, when, when the Syrian electronic army activities became more organized, there are a lot of heads, cybersecurity experts heads, showed up on the level and they became the leaders of cybersecurity, uh, of the Syrian electronic army, which led to an actual hacking group uh, that they did a lot of, um, um, uh, hacking attacks. Uh, they hacked. Uh, they hacked the White House. Uh, um, President Obama campaign in 2012. They hacked um, almost 17,000 accounts of, of Syrian um, users, mostly activists online. Um, they developed malware. They carried denial of service attack. Um, they literally um, flood the, the cyber, the internet space in Syria with with uh, malicious codes and malicious uh, software. So the cyber jihad, actually, with declaring ISIS in 2004, when the hacker Junaid came uh, to Raqqa city, that was the time when actually cyber jihad became an organized uh, part of, 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 of ISIS uh, military, I would say, uh, because most of their attacks, they were literally organized. Um, this is another example. This is one of, exa of examples of um, um, not well-designed malware by the Syrian electronic army, which fakes uh, an encryption chat. So this is an, it, it, this, uh, this software claims that it's, uh, it, it will help you to encrypt your Skype chat. So you will be downloading this software and then you will click on encrypt my chat or decrypt my chat and this will help you to encrypt your conversation supposedly, but actually it's a malware, which means it's a malicious software that actually captures your, uh, your conversation, your username, passwords, and it sends that to uh, the Syrian electronic army team. So ISIS followed a lot of these strategies, literally followed the same strategies by flooding Western websites with comments, by building not very well malware, but effective. Um, they did a lot of phishing attacks, which I will be commenting on now. Um, what led to this internet conflict uh, in Syria, cyber conflict? Um, whenever there is a military conflict on the rise, I would say, for example, Aleppo uh, operation, the, the, uh, the Syrian electronic army will become more active. Same thing for ISIS. Um, ISIS, um, they, they had a huge army of, of media experts and, and good users of social network, I mean good as technically. Uh, but at the same time, they had this organized also group of taking chances and opportun exploiting opportunities to hack into journalists or to hack into uh, what they consider as uh, opposition at least to uncover them in places where they control, like in Raqqa cities. Many journalists got killed by some technical mistakes that led to uncover their activities. Um, Syria on the internet side is a totally decentralized country. Uh, when I say decentralized, I mean the infrastructure in Syria is not controlled by one entity or one group. Um, before 2011, the Syrian government was in control of the infrastructure in Syria. But then every day, the Syrian government is losing control over territories as a punishment. They disconnect these areas from the internet, uh, which led to um, uh, activists start using VSAT, which means satellite internet connections, or actually bring connection through cables and microwaves from neighboring countries like Turkey or Lebanon or Jordan. Um, these decentralizations made the things more complicated because um, a guy who owns a coffee, internet, a coffee shop in, in Raqqa uh, with a VSAT can actually surveil its own users. There's no regulations, there's no policy, there's no law, nothing. So that gave um, groups like ISIS the freedom actually to be more uh, controlled when it comes to the internet. Um, the situation is still as it is. Uh, whenever Syri the Syrian government is taking back areas, they, re they connect the area to the internet. So it's a punishment action uh, that's really taken by the government to disconnect uh, areas. Um, again, uh, the cyber activities or the online activities of, of uh, 
uh, of uh, jihad, uh, cyber jihad, it started with doing some simple stuff like this. This is, the, this is the original photo, for example, and they photoshopped it and they used it. Uh, they adopted it actually for their own purpose. Same things exactly on their uh, hacking uh, uh, activities. Um, a citizen lab actually is um, um, is, a, is a university. Uh, it's an institute based on the University of Toronto, and they have um, they do a lot of research on on organized uh, militias, uh, cyber activities. And this is a report talks about the first uh, phishing campaign, spear phishing campaign, that it was. Um, carrying uh, against Raqqa being slaughtered silently um, and to, to, um, to get information uh, to hack into their accounts. Twitter uh, actually successfully, I think they hacked uh, their Twitter account uh, once, uh, but also it was uh, against their, their emails. Um, spare, phishing, uh, spare phishing means that there is a dedicated team. They will study your group, know your names, find your addresses, and design a fake uh, email and website, so you will be giving up your credentials as it is your login to your Gmail, but it's actually a fake website. And they started by actually developing phishing uh, activities. Um, this is actually, this one it became really serious. Uh, when, when ISIS moved from designing spear phishing, which relies on social engineering more than technical engineering part, to design an actual malware. Regardless if the malware was not well designed, uh, but it's a still malware. Um, it's a software that they wrote. It has a malicious code. Uh, they have targeted attacks, and they try to keep this persistence access to their machines and collect their information. Um, at the beginning of the Syrian Electronic Army, we were talking about this is serious, and a lot of security engineers, after uh, doing some reverse engineering to those malwares, they were making fun of them. They were like, well, they're just kids. Don't take them serious. But then things became really serious when they hacked into the White House campaign. Um, same things for, for ISIS. They started with this not well-designed malware, but things carried on. Um, this, is, this is so interesting. So the, the, the cybersecurity, um, and I, I, it's just fascinating how organized is ISIS when it comes to the cyber uh, or surveillance um, system that they have in place. It's not just spare phishing attack. It's not just denial of service attack. It's not just uh, uh, malware, but actually an actual surveillance cameras that they have in the city where they actually watch the city. So imagine if you have access to, um, to hacked machines that's fitting you with information about real information, pictures, um, emails, or you have those army of, of supporters that they follow, collect information, plus you have CCTV cameras in the street. You can do a lot. Um, another fascinating things about ISIS and, and how they adopted the Syrian regime uh, uh, strategy in, in, in fighting internet uh, or freedom on internet was ac actually when they started uh, punishing people for using internet. Um, uh, the Internet, internet, especially in Raqqa, was on and off. So one day ISIS will prevent internet, one day they will allow it in specific internet cafes. And that showed that they have an actual active body who design policies and strategies. Um, so they decided, they decided to close all the internet cafes um, once, and then they announced that to open an internet cafe, you have to obtain a license and pay the fees, but it's not this only. Uh, obtaining license means that there will be surveillance team, they will show up every time, they will inject malicious software in every single machine to watch whoever is using this, uh, these computers and why and who they are. Um, but also another strategy was also to reduce the amount of users is by to push prices to go up. Internet was expensive in Raqqa. When we're talking about one megabyte of being uh, 10 Syrian pounds, I mean, I'm Syrian, I know, one megabyte is nothing today. You load your Facebook, or Facebook update, this is a 10 megabytes at least. So 10 Syrian pounds is really too much money. So it's either by forcing access to, into specific allowed licensed uh, uh, internet cafes that they probably they're their supporters and they're giving up information or ex uh, prices they will be expensive so nobody can afford it. Um, this is one of the emails that I worked on. Uh, I've been helping some, some targeted websites in hosting them on, on some 
infrastructure that I have full control over, I take care of. And this is one of the email servers. This is a really smart attack. So what they did is they created an email server. Um, so let me, let me make it easy for you. Um, email, how email works, there is two main protocols, SMTP and whatever uh, protocol, it's IMAP or POP that receives your email. So you have a domain, which is let's say mydomain.com, and this mydomain.com is linked with your uh, email server. Now, to receive your email, if I decided to send an email to info at mydomain.com, you will be the 100% receiver because your domain holds the information of your receiver. But I can easily fake a sender server, an, 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 an exchange server that it can send. Uh, uh, I, I can claim that this domain is mine. There might be some advanced system they build certificates to authenticate these emails, but majority of those email systems don't have such things. So in this email, um, it shows that actually a, this, this is a, um, anti-ISIS, I'll use anti-ISIS term as, it's, it's, a, it's not a friendly website for ISIS, so it, it was targeted for a while. Uh, what they did in this example, they actually set up an actual email server somewhere on the internet, and they, they, had, they went through the process, with it, which it might take four to five hours to some experts to do this, and they, they set up the fake email thing, and they start sending email to the team from that email. So imagine you're receiving an email from your colleagues. That's exactly what happened, but it's actually a fake uh, email. And inside that email, there was uh, a malware. Now in analyzing the header of the email, I was able to collect the, uh, the, the server of, uh, the IP server of this email server. And it's actually a hacked website for a pizza restaurant uh, somewhere in Europe. So what they do is there are an actual hackers hacking uh, not well secured website and then they build their own malicious infrastructure on that to initiate attacks. But then, um, uh, but then also, so it shows you that actually the team leaders are really good expert geeks, but at the same time the actual uh, soldiers that they're doing actions are not expert. So I, I tracked some IP addresses of the email servers from the browser and I found two email addresses, uh, two IP addresses, one from Qatar and one from Turkey, and actually those uh, IP addresses were linked to a mobile. So what happened is, um, I guess there is a group where the, this team leader hacker set up this email and then start sending username and passwords. Hey guys, log into this email through this link and start sending these malwares to those guys. And they did that without protection, without handing their emails. And that tells me that those guys are not experts. But at the same time, there are experts. Uh, the, the team leaders are experts. Uh, two points I want to comment on. Um, I, I, I'm still comparing the Syrian Electronic Army to ISIS Cyber Jihad because the strategy of Syrian Electronic Army was so powerful, they, it worked well in Syria. So why not duplicating it? Uh, so they are really duplicating uh, whatever uh, Syrian Electronic Army did, but the only difference which freaks me out is those guys are mostly foreigners. They hold European passports. They have bank accounts. At the same time, Syrian Electronic Army are a bunch of like Syrian citizens. They live in Syria, a majority of them. Because of sanctions, they have no access to online banking system. Because of sanctions, they cannot buy a lot of softwares and license. But the other guys have a lot of access and power uh, and uh, to, to purchase, to pay for hackers, to other hackers to do uh, denial of service attacks. And I've seen that in many times comparing to the Syrian Foreign Army. The volume of denial of service attack against uh, anti-ISIS websites was way higher than the volume of denial of service attacks against um, opposition websites, which means it's easier for them to go on the dark web and pay someone 200 euros to initiate a one month long denial of service attack to take a website. Um, with all complicated things now that's going on, the activities of, of, uh, of ISIS, pro-ISIS, cyber jihad unit, whatever it is, is going down and I think it's because of what's happening on the ground. Uh, but uh, the cyber jihad as a concept never died and it's, uh, it might restart um, again whenever those fighters are going back to their countries. Thanks. Thank you very much for this. I think my, my first question is, is, an, is an observation. I think when you say 
cyber jihad, and I'd love to talk about the term a bit more as well. We mean very different things. It's on the one hand propaganda, media, PR campaigns. Uh, it's also disruption of both discourses and networks, infrastructure, etc. But then it's also classic traditional state actions almost, hacking, phishing, uh, surveillance, uh, like a proper state, so to say. And I had a thought listening to you, I think governments usually try to play security against privacy, um, to say that in order to be secure, we have to sacrifice privacy. But I thought it was very interesting that you observed that ISIS is using insecure websites in other countries. Would you say, and this is now my question, that the fact that ISIS is using these tools could help the narrative to say that to be truly secure, we need to make people, networks, uh, devices secure rather than having governments undermine security. Um, absolutely. In another case, actually, I was just uh, investigating some North Korea-related malware, and I've seen um, um, some hackers are using an outdated website. The last time this website was updated was in 2007. So this person purchased the server. It seems like he forgot his credit card out there, and it's been paying all these years. Nobody's updating this website, and it became an, uh, an area where those attacks are, st uh, are being initiated. Of course, no hackers is gonna pay using his credit card or her credit card to buy a server and initiate attack. They will look for, for some vulnerable infrastructures, uh, especially in, in countries where it's hard to, like Europe, there is, some countries, they have strong privacy uh, policies, so it's not easy to start such uh, investigations. They'll use that, and it will be helpful for them for years. So, of course, education, uh, people need to be aware about, uh, about such things. St starting your own website does not mean just leaving it there, but you have to maintain it, you have to secure it, too, and you have to secure your own, uh, your own data, because um, it sh uh, we've seen that in, in places uh, in Syria, like Syria, for example, either by Syrian Electronic Army or, or uh, pro-ISIS hackers. Um, if they attacked one person, they'll get the entire network. Literally, they'll get the entire network. So it's your own responsibility that to secure your own, your, your own network, actually. So, I mean, you did not use the word cyber jihad at all, I notice, whereas you have. <laughs> and uh, my question is, so I have a bit of a problem with the word, even though I, I do see why you are using it actually. Because cyber always sounds very futuristic, very new. Uh, it's mostly military, military loves the term cyber. Um, and, and cyber jihad sounds extremely scary. If I want to undermine encryption, I, I, I would say cyber jihad. Um, so I was, I was curious as to why you not, did not use the term. And then my question is though, what is genuinely new about the kind of propaganda that you're seeing? What is new and what isn't? What is so unique about it that it deserves its own term? Or not? About cyber jihad? Um, no, I mean, I, I don't uh, place uh, like uh, so much significance on the term. Like, I understand why you might use it in reference to a jihadist group, but it just doesn't mean too much, you know. Because as, as uh, this had emphasized, you know, with the uh, Syrian electronic army, this is pro-regime, but no one like calls that uh, Assad jihad <laughs> or uh, Assad cyber jihad. Um, so, I mean, uh, in, uh, in a way, really, there's continuity with other uh, factions or militant groups uh, using hacking and, uh, uh, and uh, malicious software and other techniques to further, to further their own agendas. So um, for me, like, you know, making like, cyber jihad so unique, it doesn't seem such, uh, I, I'm, not, I'm not so convinced by it. Well, you did describe a lot, um, a lot of techniques that are used in public relations, propaganda, whatever you want to call it. Uh, and it was very fascinating to listen, but I was wondering, what is genuinely new about it? Is this just, are they just copying what everybody else is doing? What corporations, what Western governments are doing? What is so new about it? No, I think in terms of the media production, which is, I think, needs to be distinguished somewhat from the, ha the hacking, there are trends that they did set that other militant groups then imitated, and you can see that. Uh, so I mentioned the auxiliary news agency, AMAC, as, a, as an example of that, uh, and also provincial news feeds and uh, the general high-quality production. And you see now that all the groups are now following that trend. And one question was, you mentioned censorships. I, know, I don't know if you know the work of Anita Godes. She's at the University of Zurich, and she did research on, on Syria. 
to understand, is it beneficial for a state to cut off the internet? Because if you cut off the internet, you can't surveil anymore. If ISIS is adopting strategies of states, uh, is it useful for them to cut people off the internet or is it actually counterproductive? I think it's happened recently where ISIS start to turn off internet cafes and prevent users from actually uh, getting access to the internet. But I think there is a reason here uh, because a lot of those foreigner fighters, they were going to these internet cafes and to talk to their families, reveal some information, and those internet cafes became actually a target for a lot of Western intelligence. So, uh, hey, instead of um, revealing some serious information, I'll just cut off the internet because it's, it's became more expensive for ISIS. So that was the reason why recently they totally prevented internet access. Actually, in the documentary evidence, it became evident over time that the goal was uh, to prevent uh, people from having a private internet connection. Um, so, internet wasn't outright banned, but you had this uh, licensing, uh, the, the forms for licensing, uh, having a licensed internet hall. And then people can use it, but the, uh, clearly the idea is as far as possible for Islamic State to be able to monitor what was uh, going on. Uh, in terms of communication. I mean, I don't know how far, because I'm not a cyber expert like uh, Dilshad is, I don't know how far they got like in terms of hacking into communications and seeing what people were saying to each other. But it's certainly in talking to people, uh, like for example, my own family in Mosul, because they didn't want to talk, they didn't want to talk about, um, uh, they, they eventually didn't want to talk about what was going on there because they thought that, you know, the in there was clearly this fear of the internet's being monitored. So don't say anything about life there because they might consider, because then the, state, the Islamic State might catch you and say, well, you're collaborating with the enemy or whatever. Um, similarly, I, I had a similar experience in talking to a friend in Ambar because like, initially he was telling me that life under Islamic State was better than the Iraqi government. So then I said to him in a subsequent conversation, maybe you get me some documents about life there. He said, well, I'm cautious in giving you information because the internet's being monitored and uh, I don't want to do anything that harms the Islamic State. So they certainly created that perception that the Islamic State was watching their communications, even if they hadn't actually got the software to do it. Um, whether they did have the software, again, I don't know enough to say, but they created that perception of fear and uh, how effective though it was in the end is a bit more questionable because uh, for a long time, you know, there were strikes that, the strikes that took out senior personnel and that suggests intelligence penetration of some kind. Uh, despite the Islamic State's attempts to limit private internet connection and access. Yes. Um, the problem is it's in place, in, in place like Syria where US sanctions is preventing users from updating their windows or installing antivirus or like keeping their computers safe. It's so hard to tell how many people get hacked, but we've seen a lot of people being picked up from internet cafes. We've seen a lot of people being picked up just for the reason of having internet connection at their home. So um, how sophisticated is their surveillance system? I don't know, but for someone who is capable of building a malware, of course they control um, internet cafes that they've been licensed. And a lot of people got picked up from internet cafes immediately while they are having a conversation. Uh, I mean, uh, same thing for, for satellites. A lot of people got uh, arrested for just having internet. Are there any questions from the audience? Yeah, hi, I have a question for Simon. In the first talk we heard about it, like uh, one of the reasons why this conflict could accelerate is uh, that we are pushing like a Muslim population towards the fringe, especially in Europe. Uh, and I saw on your website that you are affiliated with the Gatestone Institute. And being the Gatestone Institute, it's like one of uh, the main sources of like uh, anti-Muslim rhetoric, especially like in the German uh, election. How do you make that connection when you're talking about uh, media strategies or counter measurements? Um, just to know, I actually don't uh, written for them since 2014 because I stopped for that very reason. Right? Uh, but I agree with you about them pushing uh, anti-Muslim stuff, but I don't want to comment more on that. No, no, <laughs> because it just was looking up and it's still on your website. No, no, I the I don't I don't think I have it on. I I see there's a like a link to it on my website like as an advert advert. I've tried to remove it, but I can't do anything about it. But it's your website.
Uh, that was really interesting, both of you. I have a question for, uh, for each of you. Eamon, I'd like you to talk about this aura of credibility that the Islamic State weirdly managed to get for itself, where in the wake of an attack, when a claim comes out, people will say, the Islamic State has a, a good track record of being honest about the claims that it makes about operations. So really, even if there's no other evidence, we should really take this very seriously and there must be some sort of connection. Obviously, it's not at all that simple. I know you, you wrote something really good about this in the wake of the Las Vegas claim. So I was wondering if you could expand a little bit more on that, um, just so we could hear some of your thoughts there. And Dilshad, um, I wanted to uh, ask you, just how big a problem you thought this was. So I, when, when you were speaking, I um, remembered that at the end of November, uh, at the, I think it was 20, yeah, end of November 2015, George Osborne, who was, I think he was chancellor in the UK at the time, he pledged 1.9 billion, billion pounds to go into counter, well, he said it was going into counter-terrorism, uh, information security. The claim was that uh, the Islamic State had developed um, the ability to attack the United Kingdom through its infrastructure. Um, I mean, at the time I thought it was ridiculous. I still think it's ridiculous now. Um, it kind of, I mentioned earlier about the Islamic State being a useful label to, to get certain things through. Um, I wonder if you could talk a little bit about that and if you think that perhaps the formidable uh, nature of the Islamic State's hacking uh, capabilities has been a little bit exaggerated, or, or if you think we're missing something. I'd be interested to hear more about that. Thanks. Uh, okay. Uh, on the aura of credibility, yeah, you're, you're right that uh, it, there's, because of the frequency of attacks that have occurred, that there's an instant reaction whenever and something does happen to say, well, let's uh, monitor what the Islamic State might or might not say. And it, it's, an in, it's an instinct that, that's been widely developed. Um, and uh, yes, in terms of credibility, uh, rather than actually trying to take things on a case-by-case -case basis, uh, I think the general problem has been about uh, wanting to leap to one conclusion or another. It's like either they're always reliable or like it's all just like total opportunism. But in reality, everything has to be taken on a, an individual basis. Uh, because sometimes, you know, when you had the, say, the Orlando attack, uh, there was a sense to dismiss it and say, well, he didn't have anything to do with the Islamic State. And then subsequent uh, transcripts showed that he, you know, had quite clearly been following Islamic State propaganda and was, was well familiar with it. Uh, and then on the other hand, though, with Las Vegas, this is, again, this is something that's, you know, really not been proven uh, at all. Um, so I think uh, the, uh, the aura of credibility, yeah, it's, it's also partly contributed by the media atmosphere that, you know, the Islamic State conducting a mass attack, it's always like a big story and always fills the headlines. And so, um, yeah, rather than actually exercising restraint and reason, uh, there's this, uh, yeah, they think there's these, there's these instinctive reactions that are not helpful. Thanks. I think it's ridiculous. <laughs> That's the first comment. Um, of course, ISIS became the label for a lot of um, um, politicians. Um, even in the US today, the, the conversation of FBI granting FBI backdoor, backdoor to encryption is still hot on the table. And every time ISIS is um, present on the table of discussion, uh, when it comes to federal government trying to force civil society or academia to accept these kind of actions. Um, I mean, there is no definition of improving the infrastructure of cybersecurity of UK. I mean, we've seen how ransomware impacted the healthcare, uh, uh, I mean, Ministry of Healthcare and Hospitals in UK recently, and that was a major attack. Um, Yes, you can say you need money to improve the security of your infrastructure, provide training, explain a lot of terms to users, provide them with capabilities to protect themselves, improve systems. But uh, to be honest, ISIS is, uh, is way less than APT29, APT28, uh, Cozy Bear, uh, Fancy Bear, Ration, uh, APT groups, um, or even um, European-based uh, 
uh, intelligence that the flood Middle East with malware recently. So um, there is no definition that you can build something on, on by asking for money to counter ISIS cyber capability. So you mentioned about e exaggerating cyber hacking capabilities. What about exaggerating the effectiveness and appeal of propaganda? That's something I'd be very curious about because this is also constantly used to increase tracking. I've recently been targeted with a don't join ISIS ad on YouTube simply because I watched a hijab tutorial for one reason or another. But sort of like I, it, it feels very invasive as well. So I'd love to hear your thoughts on that. No, that's actually a very good point because uh, if you take the media campaigns that I mentioned uh, uh, in the earlier in, in the early part of, the part of the talk, like for example the appeal for jihadis in Somalia to pledge allegiance, um, I mean it didn't have like this ripple, it didn't have this massive effect where all jihadis in Somalia or even most of them want to become Islamic State now. Like there was a small faction that was long, that was known to have Islamic State sympathies and you know it has emerged and there is media output from Somalia but it's not like you know the prop video campaign massively changed the dynamic dynamic on the ground. It's actually the case, I think, for a lot of uh, the Islamic State's video campaigns. Like similarly, they try to monopolize the Palestinian cause and say that uh, you know to turn it into one of you know jihad for the Islamic State against Jews. But I mean, the Palestinian cause main it remains overwhelmingly nationalist rather than you know anything Salafi jihadist. Um, so, yeah, I think that when you look at the actual effects on the ground, sometimes there's a uh, liability to overstate the effectiveness of Islamic State propaganda in actually influencing things on the ground. Are there any more questions? Yeah, I wanted to ask you, uh, Ayman, um, I, uh, I don't know if you can say, <laughs> but I was curious to know how you managed to acquire that documents that you show us, because a uh, time ago I was reading an interview uh, with you on Vice, and they were saying that you were able to track a lot of uh, jihadi uh, people by simply using blogs or Facebook or public records. So I would like to know if uh, you were just through public record uh, information or uh, you have other strategies all that right, you can All right, all right, all right. <laughs> That's a fair question, I will answer it. Um, so I have like a raw archive of things and um, for that I've actually put in as much public stuff I could find as possible. And a variety of sources for that. Uh, so for example, actually, uh, some of the early work in putting out documents was done by ruckus being stored silently. And when I was asked about this by Washington Post, they said, look, some of the, uh, the documents that get put in public domain, they come from anti-Islamic state activist groups that were doing this good work on the ground. Um, others, though, they came from uh, obscure Facebook pages or obscure Twitter accounts. Um, for example, I remember in around the turn of Jan two early 2014 or early 2015, like there was this Islamic State guy in the Nainawa area of Tel Afar and he was putting out copies of Friday, U Unified Friday Sermons. Um, but some of these, doc these, some of these documents I showed in the presentation though are not uh, public domain stuff that I could just find by looking at obscure corners of the internet. Um, um, the one from the principles of the administration of Islam Islamic State came from a businessman in Membridge uh, who actually eventually disappeared and I I mean, I don't know it for sure what happened to him, but I think he was probably executed in January of 2016 by Islamic State. Um, some of the others, though, they came, so uh, some documents, for example, have been collected by uh, Syrian rebel groups uh, that they might have helped defectors get out, uh, or from prisoners, they Islamic State prisoners they took. Uh, so, for example, in uh, North Aleppo, uh, there's a group called Ahrar Sharqiyya, which is originally from Deir ez Zor in eastern Syria. And they had, as I understand, they have these kinds of connections with people in eastern Syria, but they also took stuff from, uh, say, when the, from the capture of Al-Bab in, in North Aleppo by the Syrian rebels or when they took IS prisoners. So there are a variety of different so uh, chan uh, means of obtaining documents, uh, both public means or open source and uh, private thing. Uh, Private collections, I've not largely, I have largely not published uh, them, so I've still got hundreds of, or in the thousands maybe, of documents I've still not published yet. But hopefully I'll get around to doing it in the future. So, 
So um, the chat you described a lot of data gathering uh, by ISIS, and um, I can see how it can spread fear in the population of uh, controlled territories to have someone who can control you all the time. Uh, but also I can't imagine there to be a very structured process for analysis of all this data that is being gathered. So I was wondering what, apart from single targeted attacks, what the goal would be and if there is a goal or if it's just uncontrolled trolls doing stuff and then not having a plan. Right. Um, as you know, ISIS is a very organized um, armed groups. They have HISPA, they have other armed groups or uh, security branches that they, they work uh, for the benefit of ISIS. Um, all their cyber uh, kind of um, uh, operations, they were fitting information to those groups to work. Um, I remember one of, and that's really uh, an advanced technique of, uh, of uh, attacking foreign journalists. There was a fake Twitter account showed up for a couple of days, uh, um, mimicking Raqqa being slaughtered silently, and there was only one extra letter on the Twitter uh, handle. And they were communicating with foreign uh, journalists, telling them, hey, in case you wanna come to Syria, I'll pick you up from the borders. You're talking about really organized um, uh, online operations with their offline uh, groups um, and that showed up in such such actions. So I think um, their, their, their strength was actually this organization, this kind of uh, organizing level of work between their cyber activities and their offline activities. And I don't think it's exaggerating. Yeah, so it's like kind of comment and question for both of you. Like, uh, I need to follow on something Charlie said. So I just want to start, when they first started, they started to call people to come to Jihad. And then their strategy turned to be calling people to do attacks wherever they are. Like speaking about the former main speaker of ISIS, Al-Adnani, he mentioned more than one time, like, okay, wherever you are, you, you don't need to come to Syria for Jihad, but wherever you are, you can make attacks and kill people. And then, like, speaking about the using of Telegram, it turned not to be more than spreading news, how, like, they started to train people how to make bombs. So I follow a couple of channels how, to can, how you can make a bomb in your house. So getting, like, some salt or what stuff, and you can prepare, like, a bomb and do an attack. So this using of, like, the different way of using Telegram, and most of this of those channels were kind of secret so not for public you need like a link or invitation by person to get to it and then how ISIS was able to track those people who want to do the attacks because like in many cases we found out that like okay those attackers they sent videos before they did the attacks to ISIS so what kind of ways that they communicate and those like stranger or like random people who are living outside in west or wherever and they want to like be in touch with ISIS so you, we know it's not easy so that's the first question for you and like the second question speaking about the internet so we've noticed that like okay the high like the high quality of videos that ISIS was producing and we heard that like part of this production took a place in Europe and like in a places outside of Syria so the videos, all most of the stuff were shot in Syria, transferred to people outside who produced that things. Because like looking or like talking about specific videos, they were like produced in really high technique that needs like really like like really expensive application to have and like really good computers to be handle all these operations. And at the same time, like using the dark internet, like to buy weapons, guns, application or whatever, or even passport. So I, we got, like we tried a couple of networks that they were using the dark internet to buy like whatever passport you need. So if you're like whatever and you wanna come to join ISIS, they can get you like American passport that's stolen or whatever. So I would love to hear your opinion about that. Uh, so I agree with both the things you said, actually, uh, about, uh, but in terms of the presentation, it was, I guess, more about, you know, the media strategies. But of course, uh, operational, uh, uh, operational considerations for doing attacks uh, uh, using telegrams as a means of communicating and, 
and uh, channels uh, instructing how to make bombs, for example. That's very important point. Uh, so yeah, I definitely agree with you. And uh, on uh, the uh, conducting attack, sure, this is because uh, you're doing wherever you are, because uh, the ability to migrate to the Islamic State in Iraq and Syria has diminished to almost pretty much impossible uh, if you're on the outside. Like, you know, gone are the days when you had a Hydra committee. Uh, well, you still, you still, maybe it still exists in the IS administration, but they had the Hydra committee that could, you know, even if you were too poor to make the journey to the Islamic State, if you knew someone in the Islamic State, then you could have that person who knows you submit a bursary application to finance your trip to the Islamic State. Uh, but now, of course, uh, Turkey closed off the border and uh, they don't have access to the territorial access to the border anymore in the way they did before. So uh, it's pr pretty much impossible to join now. So that's a practical thing behind the shift from uh, uh, to do attacks wherever you, uh, from uh, come to the caliphate to do attacks wherever you are. So again, I agree with you and thanks for your input. Thanks. Uh, for the use of technology for creating advanced uh, or good quality video, I don't think Syria lacked um, a, like good computer or processing power. I mean, we had Al-Bahsa in Damascus, the top CPUs. You could have just get the top CPUs from, from, uh, from the market. But also, let's not forget that all these equipments were coming from Turkey. The VSAT internet access, uh, they, were, they were being shipped from Turkey, computers. It's just easy to get it and smuggle it through the border. So I don't think having the computing power was an issue in, in, in the country. But experts, I totally agree, they are absolutely foreigners, even the style of creating these videos, it's not Middle Eastern style. So uh, definitely, it's either they, they, sh they, they are shipping the raw material to someone outside or actually experts are inside and they are creating these videos. On the dark web in 2013, I've, I've seen a couple of guides on teaching how to use Tor, how to enter the onion, onion domains and how to go to those illegal uh, forums and purchase stuff and weapons and passports and stuff. Yeah, I've seen that. But to be honest, today when I see majority of ISIS are using Telegram, which is not secure comparing to Signal, I feel like there is that person who was leading the strategy of their, their cybersecurity is not there anymore. So that's why I don't see, I don't see any shift uh, to match the trends of what's out there now in the market. So that's why, that's why I see them on Telegram, not on Signal. So maybe now it's, it's uh, it's, it's a time where actually their activities is going on the low, but maybe they will rise up soon. I think we need to wrap up for time. Thank you both. Thank you very much. I wanted really to thank you. And also say that so at the beginning I forgot to to mention actually that Donatella della Rata is not here because she had a bike accident. I mean, she's fine, but she could not come. And in a sense, she would have covered the part of the media aesthetic, but I think you did pretty well. I mean, um, so thank you. It was really a great uh, panel. And uh, also, we look forward to the workshop you will do on Sunday. And uh, I will tell you again to register if you didn't do before. And also, that we will meet tomorrow at 4. And we will start with a panel that is called Radicalize the Franchise of Terror. Um, so please come back tomorrow. And also remember to give some donation to the Disruption Network Club. We have a great uh, Disrupti Corner at the entrance. So uh, it's great if also if you support us. So thanks everybody for being here today and see you tomorrow at 4. <laughs>